I think I messaged you that I didn't really, I didn't, I was I had second thoughts about the title for a talk, but I think it's provocative. I think it's interesting. Lies my non-duality teacher told me. I, I don't think it, I'm not saying anyone's lying. I'm just uh, taking certain themes and just expanding them. That's all. I think it's an interesting title. It you is. Think, you think it is. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, we can do that that today, whatever you, you want to talk about. And uh, I've been looking at your site and everything. And uh, yeah, I like what you guys are doing. You know, I, I really have this, I think I, I wrote somewhere on, on Facebook, that I thought you guys are doing like the, you know, the next generation of disruption or something. So we really like that. We really like you should talk to Noel. Um, if, if you have time, Noel is the other guy with this one. And he is in charge of, um, you know, putting the site together. Uh, we talk probably about, I don't know, all day. <laughs> we work like a Monday to Sunday. It's just so much fun doing this and what's what's coming up. You're doing a lot of work and, uh, and you very, seem very professional. And uh, I like it. I like it. Thank you. How, so your age group, you're all like 20, 30 something, something like that? Or? The 30 to 40. 30 to 40. So yeah. are you one of those generations? I, I don't know all the generations. Generation X, millennial. <laughs> generation X, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's younger ones too that are, that are beginning to sprout up from this. And, and I think there is a new wave of, um, new wave of um, younger um, speakers. There's actually a group of speakers, not a group of speakers, there's just a whole bunch of uh, young 20 year olds that are speaking about this. So we're also giving them um, a spot in the void village to be able to speak. You'll see them. Oh, there's, future, yeah. yeah, it's so fascinating, you know, just seeing a lot of uh, younger folks. And I really enjoyed my talk with uh, Justin and Cheryl. Wow. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. We, yeah. we talked about everything. And they should get they should get a stage, Cheryl. Wow, it's just uh, we can talk for hours. I'm going to do a second interview with her, and then Justin. We just completely hit it off, and we were just like laughing, making oh. some. I I taught him a couple of uh, of bad Filipino words. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad, and also I mean, look. Cheryl wrote me one day a few years ago, and I didn't know she didn't know me. I didn't know her, but she wrote me an email. Said, and all it said was, "Hey, where's all the black people in non-duality?" And that's how we became. That's how we hit it off and became friends. And uh, and um, and I see you've done. You've already disrupted things. I see your banner ad on uh, YouTube features a black person. That's radical. I'm telling you, in the field of this non-duality, you've already done. That's a disruption in itself. And uh, but I think it's important. So that, that's where you guys can go. You're in the next generation. And then you're pointing to people who are in their twenties. And like when, when I started, we started, we were all in our fifties. Now we're in our seventies, some are older. So, you know, it's, it's generational and every generation has to deal with the context that they're living in. So that's cool what you guys are doing. And the generation yeah. coming after you. So I don't know if this is part of what you wanted to talk about. Oh, no, no, that's okay. We, we can, uh... That I'm going to talk about uh, something later, but yeah, I want to comment on that one with, uh, with, with, with black people. I was talking to Rebecca, Rebecca Maroon, and, and I said to her, I said, I'm so glad I found you because when, when, I, when I was first seeking, I had this idea that, um, is it only white people that gets enlightened? And she said the exact same thing. And Cheryl said the exact same thing. So there's an importance of representation. Um, it's good to represent. It's good for people of color to be in this. And, um, and we talked about privilege also and non-duality. I wonder how many people out there that's a, a person of color that don't have any access to this, that don't have any money for retreats, don't have any kind of um, support uh, when when they awaken, but I want to talk specifically about. I really like this this um, the grand scheme of non duality. Let's talk about that. You talk about the nine manifestations of context of non duality, and the first one is the personal experience of non duality. That's kind of the bottom line. You have to have a personal experience of it. 
unless you look, maybe you're a journalist who's writing about the topic or you're a professor, then you just maybe just need the information. But uh, the bottom line is a personal experience and people have been having them since people were in existence, maybe prior to that, maybe even some animals uh, and mammals have those experiences. We don't know. So um, that's the bottom line, personal experience. From there, everything, everything comes out of that. From that, you start building contexts. You start talking about how, how your uh, experience uh, changes your life around you and how life changes you. I mean, it's just, but it starts with personal experience. Yeah. Whichever, I think everyone has, you know, often as a kid or a child, uh, you have some kind of experience. And then if you value that experience at any point in your life, you don't have to value it when you're a kid. You can value it when you're an adult, when you're 50 or 60 years old at any point. Once you start valuing it and looking at it, then you've begun your journey, your spiritual journey. But it's based on personal experience. Yeah. And the, the next one is creative. This one I can relate to. I remember being a kid, uh, you know, playing music, getting my first toy of a record player, dancing around. When I was uh, in my early 20s, going to raves. <laughs> if, you can, if you can elaborate more on that one. Well, once you have a personal experience of the true, your, your true nature, the true nature of reality, then at the same time, you're living out your life. You're doing what you got to do. You're going to work. You're enjoying people around you. You're, um, you're experiencing life. And part of experiencing life is being creative. Whether you're doing a drawing on a cave wall or dancing or writing something, um, maybe just spending time alone in nature. Enjoying nature is creative too. So any of your activities then can be called creative. It could be, uh, I mean, in, in today's world, it could be writing a poem and posting it online, um, doing a painting. Anything creative will come out of your personal experience. And then when people experience your creative work, it can inspire that in them, again, that first point personal experience. So they're, they're related. Personal experience can lead to a creative work. The experience of a creative work then can inspire a personal experience of one's true nature. Yeah, so that's, this, that's what I mean by the, um, the second point. So these are the, the manif what I call the manifestations are really the contexts in which non-duality happens or is experienced. And, First was a personal experience of it. And then I, for the second one, I, I listed some creative output. Yeah. We have uh, actually just a couple of days ago, we have this artist that is going to be releasing his full album. He's going to be premiering it at the conference. And I, I'm, it's electronic music. And, uh, and that's how he expresses non-duality. And I was really, really, we were thrilled with that one. Uh, we're looking for an art installation as well, a couple of art videos. We have a, a person that is doing some sound. Uh, I think it's like megahertz sound. And then we have um, some painters that, that I'm talking to right now. Uh, it, it's, I think it's just brilliant. Uh, the next one is, is, I went through this, is scriptural and uh, scriptural-like teachings, written, verbal, or nonverbal. I, uh, when I was a seeker, I used to go to Pirate Bay and uh, look, look at different kind of like, you know, different PDF files that were old. Can you share more about that? So your first context or manifestations, personal experience, your second could be some, could be some creative um, output. And at some point you start getting people form, creating formulations regarding the experience of non-duality and those can be scriptural they can be or nearly scriptural um at some point they can just be good writings you can find on uh, you know on facebook or somewhere um but that's another context for non-duality 
gathering, formulating writings and, uh, or even just verbal teachings and sharing them with an audience and perhaps having them written down so people can consult them. And, and from that you have, this is how you build traditions and religions. And uh, so that's another context for non-duality that everybody knows, just you know, reading the scriptures, read uh, whether it's a Bible or, you know, any, from any religion or tradition, you're going to find non-duality, Hindu, of course, and Buddhism, maybe, you know, most notably. So um, that's another context for non-duality, another manifestation of it. And it's something that we all access. And, uh, and again, these are also, all these different manifestations kind of uh, um, blend together. So you can call these scriptural writings uh, creative works as well. So, but, uh, but they're known as scriptural. They're associated with traditions. So that would be another manifestation I have seen some really great, great Twitter, you know, um, accounts. I have seen some really, um, I've read so many beautiful poetry. I love poetry. And when, when non-duality is expressed in poetry, it just, it's just such a beautiful expression. Uh, do you have any poet, poets uh, that you have um, encountered that, that writes really beautiful um, non-duality expressions? Uh, yeah, there are a lot. I, you know, if I name one, I'll, then I'll forget. I'll forget. I'll forget a lot of them because so many people uh, do write poetry. But I'm kind of drawn toward uh, some of the haiku because I think kind of life can sort of be lived like haiku. Um, so um, I like the writings of um, an author who was who was around in the early. 20th century, uh, R.H. Blythe, B-L-Y-T-H. I really like his writings on haiku and on Zen. So um, I was watching a video. You, you can see these haikus and poetry anywhere. I was watching a video on YouTube. It was, it was a, one of the uh, food videos where people go out and they eat and they talk about it. So one guy was sitting in his car eating uh, pizza and his wife was next to him. And he bit into the pizza and it just, you can hear the crunch of the pizza. And he said, whoa, he said, women lie and men lie, but crunch doesn't lie. And I thought that was a great poem. I thought that was a great poem right there. Kind of a haiku-ish. And for me, it resonated with a very famous haiku written by Basho which goes ancient pond, frog jumps in, water sound. So when he talk, said crunch doesn't lie, what I heard was the water sound from Basho. Just, it's just that moment where uh, the unknown meets the known and the point from which life is lived. The unknown meeting the known, the, the nothing meeting the something. Uh, at least that's one interpretation that I have. So, um, uh, yeah, so haiku is more the way I see the world, but all poetry, poetry may be the best way to express the inexpressible. And there are, some, there are many good poets and great poets. So remember that, crunch doesn't lie. I really like that. <laughs> I, thank you for introducing me to Justin. I, I was just blown away by him. Um, and to, he, to me, he's an expression of music and scriptural. He freestyles uh, hip hop, non-duality. And, and if, I, if I was a good um, uh, lyricist, I would probably you know, do a cypher with him. A cypher is usually a battle between two um, hip hop artists going back and forth. I would love to see that. I think that would, that would really disrupt it. If we have a whole bunch of hip hop artists talking about what is and going back and forth, you know, in, in a cypher battle. I think that would be, that would be the next kind of like um, satsang. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of vision probably since I met Justin some years ago, how long ago, probably maybe in 07, something like that when I first met him and learned about hip hop. And um, yeah, I mean, 
um, I think at the time, yeah, I was consulting on the science and non-duality conference. I'm not sure if I mentioned hip hop. I don't think I would have dared mention hip hop at that time, to be honest with you. So I can speak to you freely about that, obviously. And um, this shows the difference between generations, really. It shows how, uh, even though science and non-duality conference is still very worthwhile going to, uh, you guys are a lot different. You know, you're, you're, this shows how you're disrupting the old school, the traditional non-duality, which isn't really that traditional. It's all very new. Um, so yeah, what you're talking about, yeah, I've had a vision for it. I've never actually spoken about it like you are. And you hopefully are actually going to do it, I hope. And, um, you're, and you know, just by interviewing and talking to Justin, you are doing it. So uh, that's what this is about. That's what non-duality is about. It's, it's not just about, you know, you know, the old white guys. It's about the world and it's about everyone and everything. It's global, which, uh, which is how you build, your, build yourself up as a global um, conference. So I'm excited about what you guys are doing. It's almost like I want to interview you, you know, but, you know, I, it's, it's almost, you know, it's really easier to interview someone than to be interviewed, but it's okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll let you carry on. So true. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just been fun. I was showing my mom um, and my dad the little video clip that we made. I'm like, this guy's from Ireland. This guy's from, uh, this, this woman's from Japan. Uh, this person is from Amsterdam. And just different different parts of yeah. the world. And you're doing that because you enjoy it. You know, you enjoy all the different cultures, right? You're not doing it. You're not forced to do it. This is your joy, your pleasure. It is. It is just. It's. It's so much. So much joy. And uh, and it's. You. You are right. You know, this feels really fresh every time that that Noel and I talk about this. There's a freshness that comes from it. And then I will say something. Hey, why don't we do this? And he'll be like, Yeah, dude. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That, you know, that's what you need. Let's go back to this, to this, this grand scheme of non-duality and let's go into the ashramic and the gurus. Um, where does that, um, where's that now? <laughs> yeah. So I said, so the previous one was scriptural. So, so the first one, you have a personal experience of non-duality. Second one was you have creative expression. The third one, all the, you, you start organizing some of the ideas and thoughts on uh, non-duality, you create scriptures, and these are great teachings. And so the fourth one, ashramic, I think this is where, this is where you have a lineage of some of that traditions that were started in that previous manifestation. So um, any, any ashram of any teacher then also shares those scriptural writings, um, but then they also add their own input, their own teachings. Um, and I think that's, you know, when I write something, and maybe it's true for everyone, you write something, you let it go, and then, you know, you sort of forget it. But now you're being interviewed, so I got to remember everything. And um, that was my impression of, of the ashramic level. And before the internet, if you wanted to access non-duality and learn about it, you had to go to an ashram, you had to go to some, you know, teacher, someone who was separate from you, who was enlightened. So you had, you know, the teacher was enlightened, you weren't, you had to go into that, into his group, his context, his, you know, his ashram, then maybe you can find out about non-duality and find out about the scriptures. And uh, so that's another context for non-duality, the context of the guru, the ashram. Yeah. In your experience, Jerry, have you been to an ashram? Did you go to India? Did you have any of those experiences? Uh, I mean, as a child, uh, I was drawn to just uh, what's called what I call the I am. Um, I pursued that in my, in my 20s. I pursued it. I never heard of Nisargadatta, but and years later, I discovered that he talked about the I am a lot. So it was just something I discovered on my own. And so that was sort of my guru. Um, but I've always consulted writings and books and teachers, and I have teachers today, I have teachers. Um, but I still believe that there's a, your own personal guru, your inner guru, the guru of your, of your own self that you need to know. And, and you, know, you follow that, whatever that is, and however you know it. 
Um, so no, I haven't. I never really went to uh, in any depth any kind of an ashram. But that's but that is clearly a context for non-duality, the ashram. And then right, the the next one after that one is academia and liberal arts, um, and it's primarily intellectual. You were mentioning, and uh, I think we're seeing a lot of that right now too. Yeah. So at some point, universities were started in among the coursework would be philosophy and religious studies. So that so now suddenly non-duality finds a home there in, in academia. Um, and that's all I'm referring to there. You go to college and you, and you can study, not necessarily a course in non-duality as such, although these days maybe you could, I don't know. But you meet non-duality in, uh, or you could meet non-duality in other courses. Uh, in philosophy maybe you might find more um, non-duality itself in some, cor some courses on Western philosophy or Eastern philosophy. What were you saying about you're finding more or academia is changing or what were your comment? What was your comment? About? There's more and more, I think, universities that offer non-duality is, is what I'm finding. It's there's more discussions about it in the ac academic level. I, I saw um, Rupert Spira got invited to one of the universities and spoke about it with a professor. So I'm like, okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. I think. Sorry, go ahead. And then I was just, you know, reading, reading uh, your, your, um, your, your writing there. I was like, yeah, that is right. I, I'm beginning to see posts of, um, of um, academic um, professors talking about or the crossover of a, a non-duality speaker going to a university, speaking to university students about this. That's um, I, yeah. I was aware, I mean, it's obvious, it's clear that teachings of non-duality are found in universities. It's always been that way, but I wasn't aware of what you're telling me that it's uh... I'll send you a link. Okay, yeah. Do that yeah. yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And the next one in, in it's kind of like uh, the science and non-duality where the intersection of, you know, quantum physics meets with non-duality and, you know, with science and non-duality, um, which is really awesome that they did that is, is combine that too. Um, in your experience with science and non-duality, can you, can you expand more on that one? I'm not really good at quantum theory. I don't really. I mean, I can read about it. I can sort of get it, and then I kind of forget about it. Then I read it again. I get it. I forget about it. Um, what I can tell you about the science and non-duality conference is that when I was helping to organize, really, the first one, I was involved with non-duality teachers. I wasn't involved in the science part at all, really. All I know is that when um, in my discussions with Maurizio is he insisted on having science as a way of providing, you know, substance and real credibility to, um, to um, you know, this, the topic of non-duality. He didn't want just non-duality teachers confessing or claiming um, their uh, realizations. He wanted the science behind it which makes a lot of sense. And, um, but I wasn't involved in organizing that, but I do from the scientists I've heard speak and met, these are legitimate, these are real scientists from traditional science. And, um, you know, their findings um, support uh, the non-dual nature of reality, whether they're coming from physics or biology or neuroscience. So again, that, um, the um, academic approach through science, physics, biology, neuroscience is another context then for non-duality. I spoke to uh, Dr. Seth Kostick and we had a really like a two hour interview about, and he just has a brilliant way of explaining the mind and, and, and the absence of the mind. And it's just, you know, in, in graphs and he's just really passionate about it. And it's just, it just blows your mind. You know what what science can can back up what non-duality is talking about, and I think that's a really um, amazing way of of, of studying non-duality is through science as well. Let's yeah. go to let's go to the next one, which is the popular, which is happening right now. Um, non-duality revealed through a wide variety of teachers, sages, gurus, realizers, psychologists, writers, um, hip hop artists. And it just goes on. There's just so many psychology. People are talking about uh, uh, 
non duality and trauma right now. What's your take on that one? Is that which what, what number is that? Seven, eight, or what is that? That is number um number seven. Okay, I still got number eight yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Trying to push ahead here. Um, what was the title of that one again? Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. That one is the popular and pedestated uh, people that are pedestal. Sorry, um, you know. Okay, I get that one. Yeah, yeah, that was the one where. Yeah. So at some point, then outside of non-duality, uh, kind of moved outside of the academia, outside of the universities, outside of the ashrams, outside of the scriptures, and it just became a lot of people. You know, a lot of teachers, everyone talking about non-duality, a lot of stuff that'll be shown at your conference, just all kinds of people talking about it. But the difference it was that between this, this level and the next one that's following is that I use the term pedestal. So these teachers, these knowers, these realizers, these claimers, these confessors, were all kind of put on a little bit on a pedestal, kind of in the sense that like, you know, well, we're in the light and, and, you know, you're not, right? So, you know, we found something, you're the seeker. So there was a division there. There was a lot of freedom, people just being themselves. Most people attached to some tradition or another, some being independent. So you had that freedom of um, not being, of having no need to be tied to, you know, uh, any tradition or university or ashram. But at the same time, there was a little bit of separation and, and, and it still exists, it's not gone. A little bit of separation between the enlightened one and the, uh, and the seeker. And that kind of separation really characterizes, along with the freedom of so many realizers and, and enlightened beings. Um, but that bit of separation, I think, characterizes that seventh uh, context for non-duality. I was talking to someone from Facebook and he called me and then we started talking about teachers and then he's saying that they're gurus. You know, he, he comes from a more of a, um, he followed gurus before and could not really differentiate between the speakers right now and the gurus from the past. He sees them as the same. Um, why do you think that happens? Why do a lot of seekers just the moment that they see a speaker even if a speaker does not claim to be a teacher or a guru, I, I some some sometimes I just see them as uh, non-duality entertainers. <laughs> yeah, what what the speakers or gurus non-duality entertainers? Yeah, I mean again, that's a whole other different level of context, um, right there. But um, look, I mean we should we should approach everybody. You know, we either put everybody if we're going to put one teacher one person on a pedestal, put everyone on a pedestal. You know. We have a guy in town just a few blocks from me, and he, and he found a home on a park bench in a, in a small park. He's got all his plastic bags around him. He's, you know, he's, he's homeless and he's got troubles, but the community keeps an eye on him and the police are aware of him. And in the winter, they'll, it's, we're in Canada, right? In the winter, they'll make sure he has a home. But for now, he just lives on a park bench and uh, sleeps there and no one bothers him. So, you know, put him on a pedestal. Put everyone on a pedestal if you're putting anyone on, on, on pedestals. It's, it's not, the guru teacher isn't special any more than, you know, we're all special. You know, you can learn just as much from the man on the park bench as from, you know, Tony Parsons. So, there's no difference. Or rather, there are big differences, but at some level of, of, of humanity and being in the world, there's no difference. There are individual differences always. Um, Can you comment on the popularity of some teachers right now, like, you know, Ajashanti, Muji? Um, it's almost like um, it's, uh, you know, in the past we had um, Eckhart Tolle is really, really popular right now in so many different um, speakers and authors that are coming out that's almost like they, they have become a brand now, which well, is good. <laughs> I mean, for one thing, they're great teachers, you know, and um, you can't deny that. And some of them, are, you, will, you know, you'll favor them one more or more another, just a matter of personal taste. But yeah, there's a, uh, you know, there's a charisma factor. People get drawn 
into that and they're following the crowd. And so there's some of that. It doesn't take anything away from the teacher. They, all those people you mentioned have, have a gift to teach, you know, so they do it. They, they deserve whatever, you know, whatever they have going for them. Um, I, I access them, their writings anyway. I don't really travel to go see people in person. I have friends right here in Halifax um, who are like my friends and teachers. And so, um, but yeah, people can get caught up in uh, some kind of guru worship. I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's, uh, again, that's just the context in which these people function. They function as uh, teachers to um, the masses. They can function as a teacher to an individual. And, you know, if you're with Muji or Aidy Ashanti or someone, and you're just uh, in a sweat lodge with them, and the heat is breaking down everything you know about yourself, um, and what is there to teach and what is there to talk about? And who is there to gather to? You know, the sweat lodge context, I think, is really, really um, important. In a way, it's like being on your deathbed. Everything breaks down. And that's a good way to be with a person. Just let everything break down. There's no non-duality. There's no, you know, talking. There's, it's all gone. It's gone. All there is is this... Uh, in touch point between living and dying, that interface. Uh, it goes back to the haiku, you know, crunch doesn't lie. It's kind of where the crunch in, in, in a sweat lodge, that's all you, you, you have the crunch, crunch doesn't lie. Um, it's funny that, that you were talking about teachers and uh, I'm from Canada, I'm from Toronto and I was in BC before too. And, uh, I really don't know much of the scene in Canada. I've always, it's, it's almost like we've always looked at Americans and Europeans um, in, in, in Nandawali as of late anyway, there's more popular teachers there. And, and I know that there's some teachers here too. Can you mention some teachers uh, in, in, uh, in Canada that uh, I know Daryl, but there must be more. Uh, I mean, just in Halifax, my friends, uh, James Travers, who's on the non-duality salon group is um, a great guy. One of my, I used to have a radio show and uh, locally a community radio show. James was one of the best interviews I've had and equally, equally impressive to me in, in different, totally different, but both non-dual people would be Mandy LaBelle, who's a well-known yoga teacher. They're both do it. They both teach a kind of non-dual yoga, but totally different points of view. And Mandy's, again, a great interview and just a great person. And uh, the two are my friends, they're my teachers, and um, they teach yoga. I don't do yoga, but uh, what they taught me is that yoga really isn't necessarily have anything to do with postures and stuff like that. So um, Andrew McNabb is on Non-Duality Salon. He recently moved to BC. And he's another one. And um, uh, Chenny, just goes by one name, Chenny, is, uh, is another. These are just people in Halifax. Uh, there are others, and there's the entire uh, Buddhist, uh, um, Shambhala Buddhist movement, which consists of a few thousand people in uh, Nova Scotia. Chobium Trunk, Trunkpa was the uh, leader of that. And that teaching is very non-dual, but it's kind of institutionalized. So you may not, may or may not want to be part of it. But they teach uh, meditation classes for free. I think it's Vipassana yoga, I guess. Uh, meditation rather, not yoga. Um, there's a Ramana Maharshi ashram in Nova Scotia. It's a powerful non-dual uh, place, actually. No, no, what am I forgetting? Just the nature of Nova Scotia is beautiful. Yeah, I love it there. I love it there. I spent uh, some time there as well. Uh, now let's talk about this exciting, um, popular 
leveled, and decentralized. Non-duality shared and revealed by everyone for everyone. That's, yeah, so that's amazing. The that's the eighth context. So the seventh context is very similar. It's people freely intermingling. You have teachers and you have seekers. You have a little bit of separation between them. In this, in this next context, the separation is gone, pretty much. I'm sure it's still there, but in this manifestation, the whole mark then is the absence of that separation. So everyone's a teacher, everyone's a seeker, everyone's a guide, everyone's looking for, for guidance. Everyone has wisdom, everyone needs wisdom. So there's a level playing field in this context of non-duality. That's, that's kind of the hallmark uh, of that. Um, and, and I should say all these levels, these contexts, they all exist all at the same time. It's not like you go from one to another, they're all there. Uh, and at, at the bottom line was the very first one, personal experience. And there's a lot of creativity going on. All the levels are still there. You still need to access scriptures. You may need to access an ashram, maybe not. And, um, and they, all just, uh, they all just keep on going. But this is really, this seventh one really was the disruption that was caused by the internet, which happened in 1998, when people started coming together and started dis discovering each other. So... When non-duality salon started in 98, you have, we had, I think, started with eight or 10 people. And we were amazed to find each other. I mean, it was virtually impossible to find another person who was interested in non-duality. Again, without accessing an ashram or, you know, something like that. So um, the internet marked the leveling of the playing field. Um, in which non-duality plays out, uh, and it's and it's still it's still like that, but it, but it's you know it's thanks to the uh, to the internet, people people speaking freely, and uh, you know everyone has their teacher, everyone has their traditions, but when we come together, all that is kind of set aside, and we just speak from our own knowing, which everyone knows. I mean, if you look at the interviews you're doing, those are examples of people speaking from their own knowing. Some might be associated with a tradition or a teacher, and some might not. Doesn't matter. And we're all teachers, and we're all seekers, and we're all always looking and always finding. And that's what characterizes that level, or that manifestation, that level playing field. I have visited some uh, Facebook groups right now that it's everything is on a on a on a, on a uh, level playing field. I've I've went to Zoom meetings right now that everybody is a speaker. There's no one speaker. There's no one teacher. Everybody's just free to talk about what is or whatever they want to talk about. And I find that really fascinating. I, I find that really cutting edge right now. Uh, in the past, you would need a teacher. You know, there would be a teacher that would that would um, you know ask you know questions and everything. Right now, everybody just chimes in. And I'm like, oh wow, this is this is really fascinating, and and I might want to feature that as well. Just a group of group of people um, put that whole group on the conference, about 20 different speakers just chiming with each other. It's just sharing. It's just wow. Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't remember that there was a time before where you weren't allowed to do that, and it wasn't really possible. Um, I say you weren't allowed it because the teacher held, just held so much power. And, and it's still that way, and it, and it should be that way. I mean, Adi Ashanti and Muji and great teachers like Francis Luciel, look, they're going to get in front of the room and they're going to teach. And these people, you know, should be accessed, right? And they should be respected in that way, and that's fine. But it's not the only game. Not the only game. So, yeah, that's the hallmark then of that eighth. If it was uh, the level playing ground and the intermixing, you know, there's no one's just a teacher, no one's just a seeker. Everyone's everything to everybody. And that's a great thing. It was unheard of prior to the, uh, you know, around the year 2000 or so. When blogging, blogging really got started in 2003. And when people started blogging, then they really started talking about non-duality in a very ordinary way. It's like, 
they would write a blog and say, did this, we went here, we went to the beach, we, we had lunch, we talked about non-duality, we went out for supper. You know, it was like just ordinary. Blogging really made non-duality, you know, ordinary. Blogging was important. Yeah. I uh, saw that too in Non-Duality Salon, which is a really great Facebook group. The writings there are really sharp. A yeah. lot of great contributions from many different um, members of the group. And, and, and that is 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 just phenomenal right? mm-hmm. you have this group that has so many so much content and uh and massive membership and i think it's still growing yeah but also what what, what i like is that there are probably a hundred or maybe hundreds of groups that split off from it and i don't know what's going on with them i don't follow them so a lot of groups uh, split off from that which i always encourage people do and uh, i still would encourage uh, I have no hold on my group or the members of my group. They come and they go. You know, I, I'm known for saying something that might be kind of offensive or stupid. Someone leaves. Well, good. You know, they they should leave, and and um, and they'll be okay, and uh, and I'll be okay. So it's very di- everything's very dynamic. That's again all part of that eighth level of manifestation, or whatever you want to call it. The ninth one is, is, is my favorite. It's very, it's a visionary. Uh, disruption, disruptive. The, what this is emerging and taking shape. Can you share that visionary um, <laughs> writing to us? Well, I mean, I think in you know, 1998, the internet was very disruptive. Non-duality was disrupted because suddenly it was taken out of the ashrams and the universities and was put in the hands of the people. It was put right on kitchen tables, you know, with the orange juice and the cinnamon bun. And that was a big disruption in non-duality, I feel. Um, And that's been going on for, you know, about 20 years or so. But now the next disruption is related to um, disruptive innovation in technology. Um, And this is something that, you know, I'm going to put in, throw into your lap, you guys, because I think you guys, uh, I mean, you guys have something really going on. And um, I think if I were uh, starting over in non-duality or if I were putting together a conference or something, I don't want to talk to people that are part of the new technologies like Tesla, Bitcoin, um, the new fintech, the way cash is disappearing and funds are flowing in a different way gaming technology, live streaming, and um, people involved in uh, genomics and um, every sort of disruptive innovation that's, ha- that's out there right now. And I want to ask them about their, um, how non-duality ties into that. How does non-duality tie into Bitcoin? I want to know. There are people that can talk about it. No one has, probably. That's waiting to be discovered. Because Bitcoin is basically a de- decentralized uh, financial system, and non-duality itself as a community is very de- decentralized. That's why people love it. You know, there's no center to it. You know, you're your own center. So um, I don't want to look at some of those. Uh, what's going on there? Um, Elon Musk said something like, "The odds that we live in base reality are." less than one in a billion, something like that. So there's a guy in touch with the nature of reality itself. And, you know, he's affecting great change in the world. Like what's going on there from a non-dual perspective? I want to explore that. So this is the next disruption. The internet itself was a disruption, but now these new innovative technologies, I think, can bring about and, and, and a new disruption. And using them, you know, like what you're doing in your conference with live streaming globally uh, with such an open mind is, I think, you know, the new, this ninth level, the new disruption. There's a lot of stuff that will open up to you and that you can look into um, that you maybe not even be aware of right, right now. A lot of new people out there to be discovered. And that's what that new level, that's the, that's the level of manifestation we're in right now. And all the preceding levels all are all still holding up. 
and any one of them can and should be accessed. And that's kind of my statement about the manifestations of non-duality. It's brilliant. It actually captures what we're doing. <laughs> I shared that with Noel, and he was like, he was like, dude, this is what this is what it is. This what is what this is what it is. It's 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 uh it's just an epic um 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 the grand scheme of things of, of non-duality and the way that we're doing this is we're looking at innovative ways as well of presenting this we we have many different ideas we wanted to have a virtual uh book thing where where we have interviews about the book and people can ask about the book so that it can go beyond the book what is the process of writing of an author of non-duality uh we had ideas about um creating um talking to cheryl and justin i'm like we should do um, non-duality in color <laughs> i mean um, i've interviewed cheryl on that topic uh pretty openly and you know and um one of the things that comes out of that for me is like i've talked to cheryl I, i've said yeah i'm prejudiced you know, against black people these black people i was raised that to be afraid of black people so one of the first things you got to do, you can start a whole forum on this, is for people to admit, uh, you know, that they have, it's superficial. It doesn't go deep into hatred or anything. It's just your conditioning to be prejudiced against um, all kinds of people. So you got to be open and, ju and just say it, you know. You oh, know. yeah, yeah. I, I've asked her actually um, really um, difficult questions and she is so gracious with answers and, and spot on. I asked her, how does it feel to be a black woman in a sea of whiteness? Well, <laughs> look, I mean, that's what's got to be, that's one of the most important things that you can, that you can do. And uh, you'd be honest about it. I mean, I dated, one of the reasons I, I promote black culture is I dated, I seriously dated a black woman back in, like in the early 80s. And it was serious. And she got kids and I was brought into all that. I have some, you know, enculturation into that. I don't claim to, you know, I'm just a privileged white guy, you know, but uh, so I have some insight and that's about all. And um, we hardly ever talked about, we were dating. We had never really talked about black and white or stuff like that. But we both worked in restaurants at the same time. And, you know, at one point, and I'm Jewish. And at one point she said, you know, the people I hate the most in the restaurant are the Jews and the blacks. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, you know, I feel the same way. I hate the Jews and the blacks too. <laughs> and, and it's not a hatred of, you know, it's the, it's work hatred. It's, you know, it's like, geez, I hate, you know, working with certain people. But we can say that to each other. And we understand that it's superficial, just work crap. It's not, there's no depth to it. And was... it brings people close. And I think that that's what the kind of stuff we got to talk about, you know, whites and blacks and, all colors. We need to um, have that level of honesty. I was uh, talking to Justin about this experience of being the only Filipino in in um, in an ashram, that or or in a in a in a spiritual setting or in a meditation. I would look around. I'm like, there's no one else like me here. Being the token uh, in in yoga in meditation because they're privileged and it's it's. Uh, and then I talked to Cheryl about. Well, would you rather spend for a meal or a twenty dollar yoga class? And and it, and it's just it's just uh, it's uh, this disruption that we're doing right now is we're hoping to reach maybe maybe uh, maybe do a free event, completely free, to be able to market to different you know people of color, and I think that would be really really um, relevant. I was even thinking about uh, I was talking to. Um, a couple of uh, uh, women speakers, and and I asked them, why is there a preference for a white male speaker? Because we were looking looking at the statistics. Luckily, we have a, a little bit of business sense and marketing senses. We look at our audience to see what's happening, and to see how we can flip that, how we can increase it to different parts. Uh, maybe we can do our marketing to um, different areas, different different um, categories. Uh, Right now, it's 75% of the people that watches our YouTube videos are white male between the ages of 30 and 50. And every time that we, we put out a female speaker, there's a lot of dislikes that happens. 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. And, and, and I love that you're talking about disruption is because that's what we're doing is we want to disrupt that. We want to maybe do a, a conference with just all, uh, you know, female speakers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a disruption. I was talking about technological disruption, but there's more to do just on a human level and to be, and to be, um, be pretty harsh about it. Like the stuff I was talking about that I was talking about with my ex black girlfriend. It's harsh. It's hard. It's brutal. But look, you're the con you're con I'm using the word context too much, but we're talking about non-duality. So, Everyone knows what's real. Everyone knows what we really mean. But everyone needs to hear what kind of goes through our minds, our thoughts. It's not always pretty. And, uh, but it can be shared as long as, uh, as, long as we know uh, what's real and what's true. And what's underneath all the surface crap. Our prejudices, our conditioning, all the crap. That's just the crap. But you need to address that. I think it's healthy to, to speak about it not pretty necessarily but it's real no sense pretending well I, I see some people I pretend well I don't see color everyone's the same to me yeah at some level yeah but I mean that's not the everyday reality you know, we see people that's judge true and everyone's uh, different but uh, that's true it, and it's, yeah, go ahead sorry go ahead oh no no it's okay and 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 I've asked speakers of what they think about Black Lives Matters <laughs> <laughs> in some of the interviews, in the long, longer interviews, and, and, and it usually um, stops them. <laughs> They're talking about, um, I'm like, so what do you think about Black Lives Matter? And some people politely, you know, politely decline, and that's completely okay too. And, but some speakers have a really great you know, understanding of what Black, Black Lives Matter right now in, in a, in a, in a non-duality context. Or how do you see a lens of COVID right now? People are talking about COVID and it's just uh, what's, what's happening. So it's, uh, it's the way that we're looking at this. It's, it's, it's a really inclusive of what people are talking about. And if they want to talk about that, that's completely okay. If not, that's completely okay too. Well, that, no, that's great that you're doing uh, those questions. I, you know, I'm not very politically inclined, so I don't think about too much about those things. I'm, I just read, head, scan headlines. But one of the beautiful things of non-duality um, community is, um, is that is that it's not central, it's decentralized. And that means you've got people who are Trump supporters, you've got people who are you know, liberals. They're all together. We're all together in this. And um, I don't know anything about Black I mean, the only thing I know about Black Lives Matter is that Black Lives Matter, you know? And uh, the people who say all lives matter, well, they have to individualize it. You know, I mean, that's true too at the same time, but it's not one or the other. It's, it's both at the same time. Black lives matter and all lives matter and, you know, indigenous lives matter. But, um, you know, there's a time and a place to focus on one or the other. Um, yeah, so I, but I think that if you're asking questions that make people uncomfortable, that's great. That's how you want to go. I mean, I mean, what, what, if, if a non-duality teacher is just restricted to their, uh, a certain rigid, fixed, frozen self, what good are they? Um, anyone who, who understands non-duality understands the nature of reality. It's, constant, it's constantly flowing and changing, and no one knows what the hell's going on, really. So, uh, and that's how it should be. Um, we get into... Uh, at some point it becomes confusing. When you leave your comfortable world behind then things become confusing. But if you keep investigating that confusion, confusion turns into wonder, right? And that's all wonder is, is just the transformation of confusion. And, um, and so the enlightened point of view is, is, is that everything is wonder. And at some point you become comfortable with wonder. You have to become comf comfortable with it. So that you can function, you know, go to work and do the stuff you got to do. Um, you mentioned yeah. something earlier that really kind of like, uh, that, that I meant to ask you before. We really need to find an, an indigenous speaker. I really, really want one uh, to, to speak. Um, I was in Haida Gwaii for, for, uh, for quite a while, actually, and was immersed 
in the Haida culture in BC. And, and uh, it's just beautiful. Some of the Haida um, culture is just mind blowing. Uh, the stories and the stuff. And, but I haven't really seen an indigenous non-duality speaker. And maybe I'll start looking more into that uh, to include in, in, in the voices that we have for the conference because I think that would be a really potent voice. Yeah. Um, even, even with sexuality, they had the two-spirit right in one person. So it does explore that, that, that non-duality even in that you know, example. Yeah, you could do that through the whole sexuality and Genre, uh, gender bending and all that's a whole other that's a whole other thing um, which is certainly part of non-duality some of the people who have the best most native sense of what non-duality is are people who are, are two genders um, who have you know have had a gender modification some of the people that are closest to an understanding of non-duality um, which makes sense um, at the Science and Non-Duality Conference, they've had some indigenous people speak, and um, it's important. And it's, you know, any of these groups of uh, individuals, you just go very, very deeply into. With indigenous people, you have many, you know, groups and, and so on. So you've mentioned the one, and you can get into, uh, you know, shamans and get into, um, that leads into uh, entheogens, you know, hallucinogenics and and that leads into all kinds of other things. It's all there. It's all tied. It's all you know tied uh, tied together. And uh, something else I mentioned in that ninth and uh, final disruptive manifestation was UFOs. And even that has uh, an association with the indigenous people and shamans and so on. Um, Alan Stiffelman is a great guy. Is, is a filmmaker who's did a, a tremendous movie on. UFO culture and shamans and indigenous people. Um, that cracks open a whole new world, a whole UFO culture where UFOs are no longer some kind of silly, weird thing that you don't touch um, because the military has said, yeah, there are UFOs, we're studying them. Um, Scientific American, and there's no publication more establishment in stated and conservative as Scientific American recently published an article saying, you know, these UFOs exist. We don't know what they are. They're not claiming to know what they are, but they're saying, look, scientists in universities, in established universities, have got to start studying what these objects are. They exist. So there's a big non-dual interface with UFOs. Again, the, the uh, idea of decentralization. The UFO phenomenon, which has been studied seriously for 60 or 70 years, there's no, there's no center to it. It's a decentralized phenomenon. No one knows. No one knows, you know, there's no, no one knows what it is. Um, I really like that. Yeah, that does make sense. That can be investigated too, the UFO. Yeah. Again, it's something no one else would do. In yeah. <laughs> duality culture. No one wants to go near it, you know. UFO, yeah. All that stuff. I, I'm, a, I'm a sci-fi geek, so. That, that interests me. Uh, yeah, that's a whole other doorway. There's a lot you can do. <laughs> There's also, a, we have a shaman in our conference. We also have um, an entheogen, um, you know, psychedelic integration of non-duality. Someone that speaks about that. So we're, we're, we're getting a little bit here and there. You know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, um, it's in this umbrella of nothing, yeah, which is yeah. the way... <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, look, if, if the umbrella is nothing, it includes everything. It's got to include that's, everything. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Any one of those things, yogin, shamans, UFOs, any one of those could be its own non-duality conference. So you have a lot of work ahead of you and uh, it'll occupy you for your entire life, which is good. There's no I, better work, you know? I know. There's no better work. I... Uh, I'm, I'm going to pause it because I want to share something that's not quite released yet. We're going to talk about the other stuff too.